Yeah, so, so go through the strategy. You're right. He is a tough guy. I mean, he's like a machine this weekend. I've got the list yeah. of states that he's going uh, to throughout the Rust Belt, including Michigan. Then he's North Carolina. He's going back to Florida. Two days to go until Election Day. Obamacare, one of the many topics on the discussion uh, screen, uh, and certainly on, Vader, on, on radars for voters. If Trump were to win, what is the plan to replace Obamacare, Andy? I think you have to look at you have to look who's where the problem really is here. Let's start with poor people that are on Medicaid. That's not going to change. People are on Medicaid. They're getting Medicaid now. Medicaid is not very good insurance. So what we're trying to do is get it so we can block grant the Medicaid funds to the states to let the states try and improve the, that that insurance for people that uh, that are in poverty. Then you've got people that are employed and people that are wealthy, and they're not the problem either. They have insurance through their employers, or they can afford it. Now insurance costs have gone up. We need to do things that will reduce insurance costs, but they're not the problem. The problem is people in the middle, people with incomes uh, that, are, that are high enough that they're not getting the subsidies on the exchanges, they're not getting Medicaid, uh, but they also don't have insurance through their employers. And the only way to insure those people, it's not very complicated, we need incentives for them to buy insurance, which we do through health savings accounts uh, or t and tax deductions, tax credits, so that you actually get a benefit if you buy insurance or if you cover your own health care costs. And then we've got competition from insurance companies because you've now got people with an incentive to purchase insurance. They're not being forced by the government to purchase it or compelled or penalized. They're being given a benefit, much like employees are with employer insurance. They'll have the incentive to purchase, and then you'll have insurance companies competing for their business, which will drive down the cost of insurance and drive up the quality of insurance. Now, in a five-minute interview, I can't lay out the whole plan, but that's kind of the basics of how we would address those three groups. Okay. Well, in, yeah, in terms of incentives, even as a millennial, a lot of my friends, they're all paying the penalty for Obamacare rather than getting insurance yes. and just paying for individual appointments because it's just cheaper, and without the incentive, you can't fix that. You just can't. That's it exactly can't be fixed. right. That's why you'd have a health you'd have a health care savings account where you could actually pay some of your own medical expenses, which will cause uh, patients, consumers to shop for better services, which will help drive prices down. And again, you'll be incentivized to buy insurance because if you don't buy it, you won't get the tax benefit or the tax credit, the deduction or the credit. And if you're not going to get the credit, why wouldn't you buy the insurance? I mean, it's it's you know it, it it's a rational way to do this. Mm -hmm that doesn't put government right in our face and in our lives the way that uh, progressives and the Democrats seem to think. They, they think government has to be involved in every aspect of our lives, and it doesn't. That's not the most effective way to get these things done. Andy, I know you've worked super hard on the Economic Advisory Council, and so I'd like to ask you, over the, the 10 to 100 days of a Trump administration, what are two or three simple things that you think he'll put in place that will send a message to people in the economy? Well, number one, we've got to revise the tax code. And I think that Paul Ryan knows it, Donald Trump knows it, Mitch McConnell knows it, the Democrats know it. We're going to get some kind of activity on the tax front. And if we can, if we can implement a plan like Donald Trump's plan, uh, the, the Tax Foundation said it would grow GDP about 7% over 10 years and create 2 million jobs, as opposed to Hillary Clinton's plan, which would cause GDP to decline about 2.6% and kill about 700,000 jobs. So we need to get moving immediately on that. Number two, day one, get rid of these Obama executive orders that have been damaging business, that have been increasing the regulatory reach of government. They're gone. He can get rid of those immediately. And begin a review of the regulatory structure in government so we can go from the most important regulations to the least important, eliminate the least important, and take that burden off of the American, uh, off American businesses. And then you've got energy. Uh, we need to release the fossil fuel potential in the United States to become energy independent so we're not sending billions of dollars overseas. He can do that very quickly. And I think we'll start renegotiating some of these trade deals very quickly as well. Andy, would you want to be in a Trump cabinet? Uh, if the president asked me to serve, I would serve. Well, I have a good job. I love that. my job. <laughs> Give me a more real well, answer. What else are you going to say? <laughs> I, I, look, I, I got to tell you, I think it would be, you know, the most fun you could have with your clothes on to be in this cabinet and get things going. It, it, uh, it would be an amazing experience. Well, as a businessman, you bring a lot to the table. I mean, look at look at these four states that are looking to raise the minimum wage right now, Andy. Arizona. Yes. 
Colorado, Maine, all looking to move up to $12 an hour. Washington state voters considering $13.80 an hour. So what would you do in, in a position of authority in an administration if these minimum wage hikes go through? How do they affect business and what do you do about it? Well, I said, number one, you, you have a guy sitting there with you who could well end up in a cabinet, too, if he can give up his TV job, my buddy Anthony Scaramucci. Mm -hmm. I asked him earlier. <laughs> we're, we're asking, yep. Well, well it's yep. nice, Andy, but I, I don't see that happening. But like you, you know, of course you'd serve the country if, uh, if, yep. I, if asked. Exactly. On the minimum wage, look, states have every right to decide what the minimum wage should be. My, I've been opposed to a minimum wage increases that kill jobs, and a lot of these state increases are to that level where they would kill jobs. I think that's bad for American workers. But I, as you know, working in a cabinet, working in the federal government, there's really nothing you could do to stop states from raising the minimum wage. They want to do that. You could use the bully pulpit to encourage them to do what's best for American workers, what's best for wages, what's best for economic growth. Uh, but, you know, look, states have a right to raise the minimum wage, as do many municipalities, and I think that's a better solution than the government doing it, because the minimum wage in Alabama really shouldn't be the same as the minimum wage up in San Francisco outside of Silicon Valley. Right. So regional, regional wages make sense to me. That's what Donald Trump said, by the way. That, that's been his position on this. Leave it, leave it to the states. Andy, great to see you. Thank you so much. Great to see you, everybody. Andy Maria, Custer. Anthony, Dagan, thank you. Thank Kat. you so much. Kat Timpf, also here.